All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on sanitary and phytosanitary issues to achieving the global food security strategy. We're going to have a great discussion today about food safety and it's important to agricultural development with two case studies on fall armyworm and aflatoxin. My name is Julie McCarty and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security and I will be your webinar facilitator today so you'll hear my voice periodically especially during our question and answer portions. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over just a couple of items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves and let us know where you're joining from. And I can see that a lot of you have done that already. Uh, the chat box is your main way to communicate today, and we encourage you to use it to post questions, share resources, and discuss the topic with your colleagues. So don't hesitate. We're all about engagement in the chat box. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer some of them along the way and the rest will hold until after the presentation. Uh, you'll see that the slides for today are available for download in the box on the left of your screen if you'd like to grab a copy, and they'll also be posted on AgriLinks. And lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and some additional resources once they are ready, which should be in a week or perhaps two weeks' time. All right, well, we've got a lot of content to get through today, and I'm, I'm excited to learn about and discuss food safety. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers, and then we can get started. So first up will be Kelly Cormier, who is Division Chief of the um, Inclusive Market Development Division at the USAID Bureau for Food Security in the Office of Market and Partnership Innovation. Kelly, um, uh, she leads a team that addresses access to finance, market system strengthening, risk management and resilience, agribusiness enabling environment and trade, and commercialization of technologies. That's a wide portfolio. So Kelly will be uh, kicking us off with a short intro. And then we will move on over to Lee Gross, who is a senior program manager with the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. And he leads the Food Safety Network, an interagency partnership between the USDA, USAID, and FDA to help build food safety capacity worldwide. And so we'll learn a little bit more about the Food Safety Network um, and some other broad aspects of uh, food safety and SPS from LEAF. Next up will be Chris Peterson, uh, who is a toxicologist and entomologist, serving as a program manager and team lead for the Food Safety in, Af uh, in Africa team at the USDA FES Office of Capacity Building and Development. And he'll be covering a, a fall army worm case study. And then we will have uh, two speakers uh, discussing aflatoxin. Ken Shengi, who is a plant pathologist with USDA's Agricultural Research Service, uh, with over 10 years experience in international agriculture, plant health, food safety, and public health. And we will close up with Elisa Loser, who is a food safety program manager with uh, the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service and who oversees food safety and aflatoxin capacity building programs in Africa and Central America. So this is a great lineup of speakers. I'm excited. And I'm going to pass the mic over to Kelly Cormier to kick us off. Thank you, Julie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be um, starting the presentation today. And I want to make a couple of key points to situate the topic in the context of the global food security strategy, and then I'll let Lee Gross take it from there. We've learned that addressing sanitary and phytosanitary, or SPS, capacity building is an important part of a strategic agricultural development approach. The global food security strategy, with its focus on market system strengthening, puts increased emphasis on plant health, animal health, and food safety, and acknowledges the contributions of this trifecta towards inclusive and sustainable ag-led economic growth, strengthened resilience, and improved nutrition, the highest level objectives for the global food security strategy. SPS system strengthening also requires an appreciation for partnership among diverse public and private stakeholders and an awareness of the unique roles and incentives that drive action for different kinds of stakeholders. USAID's Bureau for Food Security collaborates through an interagency agreement with USDA, Foreign Ag Service, and US Food and Drug Administration on the Food Safety Network in order to leverage US government technical resources to meet critical needs related to SPS system strengthening and food safety in the broadest sense. And now, over to Lee. Thank you, Kelly. So um, Kelly mentioned the Food Safety Network, and I just want to uh, make sure that everyone online today um, 
checks out our, our activities page on the AgriLink site. Um, the Food Safety Network is, is really about what Kelly said, leveraging resources, expertise, and, and partnership, um, primarily among the U.S. government, um, but certainly with implementing partners. There are three major components of the Food Safety Network. Um, the first is working with USAID missions globally um, to look at um, sanitary and phytosanitary capacity gaps um, in, in country and really looking at the enabling environment. The second piece is focused on knowledge management, um, you know, components like this webinar today, but also a whole host of resources on our activity page on the AgriLinks website. And then the third is a, a suite of online distance learning modules that we're particularly proud of, um, available in English, French, and Spanish. I um, encourage everyone to, to go check those out. But they're on a variety of topics, up to 14 different modules we have online right now, uh, focused primarily on plant health, um, but also animal health and food safety are forthcoming. So, so check those out when you get a chance. So my presentation today is, is going to um, dive a little deeper and, and look at kind of SBS as a holistic perspective, um, both in the context of the global food security strategy, uh, market systems, and, and value chain approach. And, you know, it's under this topic that you're only as good as your, your weakest link. We know that, that many SBS issues, you know, pests and disease are transboundary in nature, so looking at things from both a regional and a country perspective. Um, so SPS measures protect domestic and international food supplies from before a calf is born or a seed planted and through food production and processing to products in the grocery store. It's really all about safe and nutritious food. So the SPS agreement under the World Trade Organization is essentially about health and international trade. And what we know is that international trade and travel has expanded significantly over the past 50 years. Um, this has increased the movement of products that might pose health risks. So the SPS agreement recognizes the need for countries to protect themselves from the risks posed by the entry of pests and diseases, but also seeks to minimize any negative effects of SPS measures on trade. So the measures that WTO members apply can be classified as either sanitary, relating to human or animal life or health, or phytosanitary, relating to plant life or health. They are commonly known as SPS measures. And so the international trade aspect of the SPS agreement basically means that in seeking to protect health, WTO members must not use SPS measures that are unnecessary, not science-based or arbitrary, or which constitute a disguised restriction on international trade. You know, in looking at a, a systems approach to food safety, it's important to recognize that food safety is rooted in both animal and plant health and food safety monitoring. Even within the USDA, we have the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, the Food Safety Inspection Service, um, you know, focused at a holistic approach with the outcome being improved human health. USAID has defined a market system as including four, four primary elements. So looking first at value chains, the relationship among them, and the broader support for the enabling envir environment in which they operate, the households and communities that are engaged indirectly or directly that are affected by these value chains. So when thinking about interconnected market systems and how they support value chains, um, we really need to look at the intersection of these market systems to help avoid redundancy and, and develop and leverage complementary project resources. So for example, um, increasing risk management for SBS performance overall will support a number of prioritized value chains. So too, all value chains will benefit from activities enabling the use of safe agricultural inputs and improved laboratory infrastructure. So we really think that SPS capacity building provides a lot of bang for your buck because improvement in the overall SPS system for one value chain equals improved performance for all. When thinking more broadly about the global food security strategy results framework, um, SPS systems cross across multiple projects to help achieve primarily objectives two and uh, one and, and three of the uh, global food security strategy with the first focused on inclusive and sustainable agricultural-led economic growth and really safeguarding um, hard-won productivity gains from pest and disease outbreak. The third is, is really this focus on well-nourished populations, especially among women and children, and it's really about access to safe and nutritious food. So looking at um, cross-cutting intermediate results, there is um, SPS capacity building is focused on improved evidence-based policymaking as well as directly well-functioning SPS systems, which is a cross-cutting intermediate result, all of which are, are vital to ag development, consumer protection, and trade. 
Now next, I, I just want to highlight um, SVS from kind of three entry points. Um, and when you're thinking about your work, um, and um, you know, globally, these are the, the entry points that a number of us come, come to. So food safety is a significant matter of public health um, importance at the global level. Um, it is a focus of growing attention as global food trade increases and new agricultural food technologies emerge, eating patterns change, and new microbial pathogens surface. So morbidity due to poor food safety laws lowers quality of life and reduces economic productivity, with developing countries being especially affected. So a particular concern are microbial contaminants, mycotoxins, and chemical contaminants such as aflatoxin, which you'll hear a little bit more about today. Um, the foodborne microbial contaminants cause illness in up to one-third of the world's population each year, according to the World Health Organization estimates. Of those affected, 420,000 die. These figures are on par with death rates annually from malaria. However, what we know is that uh, globally investments in other public health um, issues like malaria and tuberculosis, food safety investments are, rather, are really quite low. So there's a need to, for countries to prioritize food safety issues and capacity within their countries, both from a public health standpoint and a sustainable development perspective. Next entry point is really thinking about the role of SPS in nutrition. And, um, and this is a, a priority. Um, uh, food safety is one of the six technical areas under the new U.S. government global nutrition coordination plan. Um, and many U.S. government-supported health and food security programs seek to strengthen food safety systems writ large or to improve household uh, food safety practices, including food handling, hygiene, and at-home food storage. Um, so through this coordination plan, the U.S. government commits to collaborating on food safety programs, sharing food safety expertise and education materials to meet the following goals. Uh, reducing illness due to unsafe food, reducing exposure to mycotoxins, and working with countries in strengthening their national food safety regulatory frameworks. The, the next entry point is thinking is through a trade lens. And with the Foreign Agriculture Service, this is a, um, as an export promotion agency, this is a, a topic that we, we work and think about a lot. Um, but we know that there, there are benefits um, to extremely poor households, both directly and indirectly from trade, um, through improved market access um, for their products, increased employment opportunities, as well as access to affordable, high-quality food, medicines, and other consumer goods that are critical to the poor. Um, however, modern and reliable food safety systems are becoming a mandatory prerequisite for a country's access to global markets. Um, and however, while food safety standards and regulations around the world are converging on a preventative controls approach, a myriad of private standards and multiple government regulations are not harmonized. So many developing countries' exporters struggle to integrate compatible food safety systems and global supply chains, while some smallholders also struggle to meet these new requirements. We know that for more than a decade, lar the largest importers and retailers in developing countries have been requiring their suppliers um, to comply with domestic food safety regulations, um, such as ISO 22000 or Global GAP. And then since 2004, the European Union with um, Hazard Analysis and cr con Critical Control Point, or HACCP principles. And then more recently, um, something to be aware of is certainly the uh, implementation of the U.S. Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA. Beginning in 2017, the U.S. importers must begin verifying that their foreign suppliers are implementing certain preventative controls in their food safety plans. So globally, from both an access and a trade perspective, um, it's important that countries are investing in these SPS systems and in the harmonization of, of trade standards based on science-based principles. So next, I want to orient people around kind of looking at um, in your agricultural value chain programming, if we think back to the, to the market systems approach and where um, you know, key investments can be made. Um, but thinking about um, SPS issues within these value chains. So um, the more steps in a value chain um, from production, harvest, storage, preparation, shipping, the greater risk that food is contaminated or spoiled. Um, and additionally, the longer the chain, the more vulnerable to shocks of climate, energy costs, food safety, phytosanitary problems, corruption, social political unrest, as well as policy constraints such as interstate and international tariff and non-tariff trade barriers. So the food safety challenge is magnified in an unstable value chain and when the share of perishable and animal source foods in total food grows. 
Food safety hazards can occur all along the value chain. So generally they can be described as microbiological, so mycotoxins, bac bacteria, infectious, infectious pathogens, uh, chemical pesticides, fertilizer, veterinarian drugs, and counterfeits, or physical heavy metals, pests, um, plant and animal diseases, poor production, um, bureaucratic processes leading to commodity aging or decay, transportation, container integrity, or ineffective regulatory environment. So, uh, for example, something that happens at input level will ripple through the whole chain and may have a negative impact on consumer health or trade. So, in looking at a, at a risk mitigation strategy for SPS issues, we need to think about uh, preventative control points along the value chain and where uh, critical investments can be made, whether that's um, at a regulatory level through policy, um, a physical infrastructure level um, with laboratory investments in laboratories, or uh, integration of, of best practice production process and handling. Think about your development activities, and, and we're continuing with the case studies today, um, you'll be able to see kind of where hazards exist within a value chain and the strategic interventions that the project has taken to kind of mitigate um, that risk. So in conclusion, um, SVS systems are complex and cross-cutting, and, and we really feel that they're both a necessary and integral part of agricultural um, value chain investment strategy. Um, so as a country's agricultural sector achieves greater production efficiencies and improved physical infrastructure, food yields and domestic food security will increase. Um, but they require a high degree of coordination from regional government bodies, national governments, private sector entities, um, U.S. government and other donors and, and implementers um, to work collaboratively to have true impact. So we look forward to continuing the discussion um, through the two case studies today and, and looking at um, overall how you're strengthening SPS systems in your agricultural value chain work. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, to all of you who are joining us today, please do feel free to enter your questions at any time. We'll be asking some or answering some along the way, and we'll also hold some to the end of the presentation. Um, and, and also, please feel free to share your direct experiences that you have with working for food safety in the field, and if you've observed any particular uh, hazards that you'd, you'd like to bring up and share with your colleagues. But for now, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to Chris Peterson for a case study on fall armyworm. Okay, thank you, Julie, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the, uh, the webinar today. And so I'll be presenting a, uh, the results of a case study in Zambia where I was able to spend two weeks on the ground in Lusaka and interviewed as many people as I possibly could uh, to see the, uh, the scope and the extent of the problem. And the objective of about the next 10 slides or so is to show how the control of one pest can intersect with the SPS framework that Lee presented. If you recall the S-shaped uh, graph that he showed a few slides ago, uh, this one pest intersects at many of those different uh, uh, different areas. So, and my slide is not, there it goes. Um, so, fall armyworm uh, is recently introduced to Africa, and it's it's been devastating. Uh, the FAO uh, provides crop damage estimates, which reach into the billions of dollars continent wide, and in heavily infested fields, it can completely uh, completely uh, eliminate the entire crop. Uh, we have this pest in the United States, but it's not as much of a problem, A, because it's native to the United States, but also in the winter it gets killed by the, uh, by the cold temperatures. In Africa, that's not the case, and so the African climate permits a continuous life cycle of this pest. And uh, we've found that anywhere in any time corn is actively growing, fall armyworm is present as well and causing damage. Now, uh, most of the attention has been to the, uh, to the maize crop, but uh, there's other strains that attack rice, and, in, and overall, over 80 different plants can be, uh, can be affected, which causes a lot of considerations for management because to control this pest in, a, uh, in an integrated fashion, it's going to need to be, uh, equal attention is going to need to be paid to all of the crops and even the non-crop plants that this pest infests. Now, so I'm not going to talk too much today about how to kill fall armyworms. Uh, there's an excellent booklet put together by USAID and Feed the Future on fall armyworm, and the, uh, the link is provided 
at, uh, on this slide here, and uh, I see Julie's just posted it into the chat box. So uh, please feel free to download that booklet and uh, make use of it. It's very, very thorough, very, uh, very well researched, and uh, will provide uh, answers to most of your questions on fall armyworm management. As I mentioned, I'm going to be speaking today more about the intersection of the management of this pest to the overall SPS systems. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, fall armyworm is native to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we're not exactly sure how it got to Africa. Um, it's a very strong flyer, but it's not able to cross the Atlantic Ocean, so it had to come in somehow uh, through shipping either by, by sea or by air. And the port inspections at the, uh, at the ports that received our uh, products from the Western Hemisphere were unable to, uh, or they did not stop this pest from getting into Africa. Uh, but once it got to Africa, it had virtually unopposed access across all of Sub-Saharan Africa. There was just no natural barriers that, uh, uh, that were able to slow its spread. And so it was first detected in January of 2016 in Nigeria. It was probably there longer. They just didn't know what they had. Uh, but then about two years later, virtually all of Sub-Saharan Africa was reporting fall armyworm. And so in Zambia specifically, uh, where, as I mentioned, I spent a couple weeks looking in depth at the problem, is that uh, fall armyworm was first detected there in late 2016. In the first year, they reported about 130,000 hectares infested. By the second year, uh, it was about two and a half times that, uh, almost three times that, as far as uh, uh, hectares infested. Um, it, it, uh, yeah, it just has a very quick uh, life cycle and uh, is very good at, uh, at spreading, around, <laughs> spreading around the world and making more of itself. Uh, this overwhelmed the government resources uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture, and the Office of the Vice President in Zambia issued an emergency declaration that allowed access to a contingency fund to respond to emergencies such as this. The funds from that, uh, from that contingency fund were used to purchase re uh, pesticide rescue treatments and to distribute seed for free to farmers that were affected. However, uh, that first growing season was half over before they even conclusively identified that, uh, that it was the fall armyworm. And so, unfortunately, it was too late for many farmers to, uh, to save their crop from this pest that first year. And so, uh, the second growing season, which just uh, concluded in the last few months, people generally acknowledge that the response to the fall armyworm was better than it was the first year. They knew what pest they had. Uh, they were able to utilize resources to, to better control it. But also, uh, people across the board, from NGOs and the private sector and the government, uh, developed and distributed educational materials, uh, some of it very technical for the, uh, the large-scale commercial farmers. Some of it was for uh, at the small, uh, smallholder farmers uh, that were based mostly on pictures with minimal text, and in some cases, the text was presented in the local language uh, to educate farmers on how to uh, on how to respond to this pest. There was also mass media and social media campaigns that got the word out very quickly and, and uh, very effectively. When I was there, we were talking to taxi cab drivers and uh, servers at restaurants asking them about fall armyworm, and they all knew what it was. They all had pretty good information about, uh, about the extent of the damage. So the public was, uh, was educated very quickly and very effectively. There's a lot of pest monitoring going on around the country, primarily from pheromone traps to determine the extent and, uh, uh, well, the breadth and the depth of the, uh, of the, prob of, of the problem. And uh, so we have a lot of data there. Unfortunately, there's just not much of a mechanism to do anything with the data. We've got all these numbers. What do we do with them now that we got it? But also, having two growing seasons, we know more about the products that are effective in controlling the pest. Uh, some of the initial recommendations the Ministry of Agriculture presented just weren't effective, but uh, uh, with uh, experience, uh, they were able to uh, uh, determine which ones had the best, uh, the best chance. But we did, so despite uh, a lot of these 
successes, we did identify several gaps that remain in uh, responding to the issue. First of all, the extension services uh, to reach farmers and provide information are understaffed and underfunded. Uh, an individual extension agent is, uh, uh, has under his or her uh, uh, geographic area about two or three times the number of individual farmers that would be effective uh, for that person to have. Um, also, these extension agents uh, receive virtually no budget to go and visit these farmers and the farmer groups. In some cases, they don't even have funding for internet access, and so they're not even able to receive some of the, uh, uh, some of the materials that are out there. Pesticides have been the go-to uh, solution for fall armyworm. Uh, there's a lot of research into uh, integrated techniques, but pesticides for now remains the most effective and the most commonly used. But pesticide regulation remains weak. And uh, as is common throughout, uh, throughout Africa and most of the develop, uh, developing world is that uh, substandard counterfeit and contaminated products are very common in the market. And at best, you know, these substandard products, for whatever reason, uh, just aren't effective. And so yields are being reduced, and that represents lost food and increased food insecurity. But also the presence of any contaminants introduces a food safety risk by uh, people consuming food with residues of uh, uh, prohibited pesticides or just even like industrial contaminants of some sort that uh, you know, shouldn't be in the food. But also there's only a few products that are being used widely. And when that happens, the stage is set for the development of insecticide resistance. And so uh, everybody we talk to is concerned that within three to five years, most of the products that we're currently using for fall armyworm won't be effective uh, anymore just because of the development of resistance. But unfortunately, getting new products into that part of the world can be a very slow process that doesn't always work as well as we would like it to. We also noticed a significant gap in uh, multi-sectoral communication and coordination of information and control efforts. First of all, the Zambian government does not have a permanent body with a mandate to uh, address emerging or ongoing issues. There's a lot of one-off task forces and uh, uh, early warning groups and uh, various uh, ad hoc, and uh, one person even used the term ad hocracy, which uh, I love that term, and, uh, and uh, it's very descriptive anyway of uh, how things tend to respond. But with, between all these different groups for different pests, there's very little communication uh, between the different groups and no ability to capitalize on lessons learned from one issue to the next. And we've also found that cooperation with NGOs, the private sector, universities, and the regional authorities, uh, such as the South African Development Community or our Southern Africa Development Community, uh, tends to be um, very spotty. Uh, in some cases, uh, certain efforts are very successful in two or three districts, but are not being replicated across the country, or they only reach certain farmers in other cases, such as uh, uh, a community-based organization that works with smallholder farmers isn't reaching the, uh, the emerging or the mid-range farmers. And so uh, a, a nationwide coordinated effort is lacking. We also took a look at the inspection facilities at one of the eight land borders that Zambia has with its neighbors uh, and at the airport in Lusaka. And what we found is that Overall, the inspections are being done by properly qualified people using appropriate techniques. However, there's just not enough of them. And if the fall armyworm uh, were to leave Zambia or any African country in a shipment uh, such, uh, such as snap peas here in the picture, uh, that could introduce fall armyworm to the Middle East, Europe, or Asia. And uh, you know, just it would just use Africa as a uh, as a stepping stone to other parts of the world. That also leaves Zambian exporters vulnerable to import bans if uh, you know the presence of fall armyworm in shipments became uh, a recurring problem. Uh, certain countries could simply refuse to accept <coughs> to accept any shipments from Zambia at all. <coughs> and also, uh, the improper use of pesticides or the use of contaminated 
uh, products <clears throat> uh, could introduce residues into those shipments that, again, if it became a recurring problem, could result in an, impulse, an import ban from, uh, of Zambian products into these other countries, which directly affects the, uh, uh, the value chain and uh, goes all the way down to the, uh, the individual farmers producing. Uh, so the top takeaways <clears throat> from the uh, Zambian experience is that fall armyworm continues to, continues to be a problem and uh, will be for the foreseeable future. But Zambia doesn't have a, uh, a permanent body to respond to such issues, and the extension and public outreach efforts are underfunded and uncoordinated. Uh, the fourth takeaway, the ability of, uh, and management of pest control tools could be an entire webinar in its own. Uh, there's a lot of issues there, but just for now, uh, it's sufficient to say that it remains a challenge. But on the good side, <clears throat> there is very high awareness and engagement towards working to a solution. Everybody's taking this problem seriously. Everybody wants a solution, and everybody's uh, giving what they can to uh, uh, to make this uh, to make this happen, and then there's a lot of ongoing research and lessons learned to address the problem. Uh, the third growing season for fall armyworm, they'll begin planting in about November, December, and uh, hopefully by then some of these new tools will be online uh, that we and we'll be able to uh, better control the pest for the coming growing season. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Well, I think um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot to dig in, and I think you know, naturally some of the questions that came in during your presentation were about what can we do about all of this, and um, I thought it was interesting um, that uh, Frank Obusu Sekeire gave his specific um, example from Ghana saying that he was very concerned with insecticides because they're having a major problem with this in Ghana. The insecticide introduced by the agricultural ministry is not working, and some imported ones are very expensive for the farmers to buy. Um, so I think you, know, you mentioned the pesticide regulation remains weak, but it's to the extent that you can shed a little bit of light on what can be done about this. Wow. Um, yeah. If, if if I had a really quick answer to that, I would uh, you know probably be a, a very famous person. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the the problem with pesticide management is uh, it's going to require a multi pronged approach. Everything from market forces to get better products into these countries. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the uh, uh, pesticide manufacturers sometimes see individual African countries as too small of a market to justify developing a product. Uh, so that would need to be addressed. Also what would need to be addressed is uh, uh, efforts to uh, better regulate, uh, such as quality assurance of the pesticides uh, entering the country, uh, and uh, as well as education, uh, not just of the farmers, but I believe also of the entire value chain for there to be an incentive for farmers to comply with best practices. Mm -hmm. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of different efforts that all together will add up to a better response. Can I add to that just to say that um, it's important to know that it, um, ECOWAS, the regional commission in, in West Africa, is actually working on this very issue to, to harmonize even use of pesticides across the, across the region, but also has a, a phytosanitary task force that looks specifically at, at fall armyworm from a regional perspective. And um, so it, it's countries need to be doing their part, um, but also the, uh, you know, these pests can travel across borders. So in terms of, uh, you know, regional coordination, it's also very important, but to know that West Africa is working on it. Mm -hmm. And um, just something that I'm aware of is that the fall armyworm task team in the USA Bureau for Food Security is planning to hold some webinars within a couple of months' time, specifically looking at integrated pest management and pesticides related to fall armyworm. Uh, those aren't announced yet or fully planned, but hopefully there will be more opportunities to have conversations digging into those issues a bit more deeply. Um, I thought I'd bring up a question from Keith Shannon, uh, who says, in terms of multi-sectoral communication, do you think that FAO could play a coordinating role among the different sectors? If not, who else might you suggest to play a coordinating role? How do we have this you know, broad communication between multiple sectors working on fall armyworm? 
Well, FAO has been involved uh, continent-wide and uh, has been very active. And so uh, I certainly didn't intend to overlook, you know, their role in regional communication. Uh, one of the issues that we find, and not just with Fall Army Worm, but uh, with any regional effort, is that a lot of times those things tend to break down at the level of domesticating whatever regional, uh, whatever regional approaches there are. Sometimes these countries, uh, and I'm not saying you know Zambia specifically, but um, on, on certain issues, certain countries just simply don't have the capacity to implement something that's coordinated regionally. And so when we, uh, so getting into Zambia, looking at them not having a, uh, a permanent body, for example, that could, uh, uh, that could respond to this, it, it, it certainly uh, becomes a question of who takes responsibility for local implementation, national implementation of something that FAO might be coordinating on a, on a Southern Africa regional or even continent-wide basis. Excellent. And then, um, let's see, this is just a very quick one. You, you may not have the exact answer, but uh, one person did ask if you know which insecticides were distributed by the Zambian government in your example. I have that information not with me. Um, there were uh, a few uh, neonicotinoids um, that had some, some effectiveness. Uh, the pyrethroids, they found some, uh, some effectiveness, especially as a preventive. Uh, I know that uh, <coughs> uh, BT powder, which is a biopesticide and certified organic, uh, uh, is available. One of the pictures that I showed was of a product call, uh, that is based on, uh, on, on, on BT powder. Uh, or, and, uh, so there's a number of them. The uh, Ministry of Agriculture website has, about, has a two-page trifold pamphlet that uh, provides a list of the, uh, the pesticides that they recommended. Great. And um, I'll just ask one more question for now before we move on. Um, I thought it was interesting. William Stewart asked kind of a, a blunt question, would country self-sufficiency reduce the spread of fall armyworm? Maybe you could mention what country self-sufficiency means. Okay. And, and that might be something Lee could mention. You know, how does country self-sufficiency relate to food safety hazard spreads? So, um, so if I understand self-sufficiency correctly, is that you know a country being able to produce all of the food that it needs and then lower its reliance on imports. Um, so first of all, um, fall armyworm is a very strong flyer. Um, in the United States, it can only spend the winter in southern Texas and Florida. So when the temperatures warm up in March, April, fall armyworm begins flying in the United States. It can be into the Dakotas and southern Alberta by September. So, uh, so when you're looking at, especially looking at the map as I am right now of West Africa, you know, you've got 15 countries within that same distance that fall armyworm is able to spread within three or four months. And so import-export, even though that's how fall armyworm got to Africa, its ability to move within Africa, uh, you know, doesn't depend on human activities to move it around. And one final bit of evidence on that is they, uh, in Zambia, they are looking for fall armyworm coming into the country on shipments. They have yet to find it on a shipment of agricultural products entering Zambia which means it's coming in on its own. It's, you know, it's, it's flying across a 100-yard wide river <laughs> rather than in a, in a shipping pallet. Just to add to that, it was really good. Um, you know, the title of my presentation was You're Only As Good As Your Weakest Link. And I think, um, you know, and we've given this, you know, presentation with regional commissions within Africa and, and trying to understand that countries need to build, build a basic um, SPS system um, they don't need an advanced model yet, um, like the U.S., even though that's the end objective. But um, it's really weak overall SBS systems that enable specific pests and disease outbreaks like what we're seeing with either aflatoxin or fall armyworm. So the idea is that um, it, within a region or a continent that countries get at least a basic system in place that um, benefits primarily their, their own consumers um, and their own producers. Um, and then next, um, helps them participate in international trade. Okay. Very good point. 
Uh, all right. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on. We can circle back to fall armyworm as some more questions come in. But we will open the floor for uh, Ken Shengi with the USDA Agricultural Research Service to focus on a case study on aflatoxin biocontrol. So Ken, please. Uh, Thank you, Julie. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. So uh, this morning, I'll be talking about aflatoxin biocontrol. Aflatoxins are a public health problem. They are also a problem for food uh, safety, uh, global food security, as well as for trade, because uh, it's, a, it's a technical barrier to trade. So uh, the subject of aflatoxins ties in very well with uh, the presentation that uh, Lee gave uh, at the beginning of this webinar. And uh, in, in the next uh, few slides, I'll be focusing on how by using biocontrol strategies to control aflatoxins uh, helps to promote global food security and uh, food safety in general. So throughout warm regions uh, of the world, staple foods become contaminated with aflatoxins. And uh, why do we care? Why do we care about aflatoxins? And why are we talking about them? Uh, the simple answer is that aflatoxins are deadly poisons. And naturally occurring mixes of aflatoxins are classified as a group one carcinogen. They've been proven to cause cancer in humans and animals. Uh, just to highlight that point, an aflatoxin B1 dose of just 20 parts per billion of a person's body weight per day will probably kill uh, a person. So taking a very high amount of aflatoxins in a short amount of time over a period of one to three weeks causes acute and potentially deadly aflatoxin poisoning uh, called aflatoxicosis. So if people take small amounts of aflatoxins at a time, but over a long period of time, then they become exposed to small amounts of aflatoxins at a time, but over a long period of time, uh, that leads to a situation uh, described as chronic aflatoxicosis. Next slide, please. Thank you. So how serious and how widespread is this problem? In terms of occurrence, can we go back a slide? Thank you. So in terms of occurrence, the most significant area affected is between 35 degrees north and south of the equator and uh, the so-called aflatoxin belt. And in terms of magnitude of exposure, uh, it varies widely across the world. Some regions of the world, like in the aflatoxin belt, are more. Sorry to interrupt that, Adam. I thought you were going to advance your own slides like we did in the uh, practice, but that's OK. Uh, because we're trying to make sure that we're on the right side that you want, if you could just uh, do your best to kind of look at the computer. And whenever we do advance a slide, if you could just read the title of the slide, uh, say aflatoxins on crops or what have you, uh, just to make sure, just say yes, that's the right side. Yes, it is. In the meantime, I, I will try to move the slide and see if that, yes, I think it works. OK, I think I can move the slides myself. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I was talking about exposure for uh, people, and uh, the point I was making is that uh, it varies globally, but in the developing world, like uh, in those three continents in the aflatoxin belt, it's not uncommon to find 30% of the staple foods available for people being contaminated with aflatoxins beyond acceptable limits. And uh, most of the crops that are susceptible to contamination with aflatoxins include maize and groundnuts. And again, like in Africa and uh, South and Central America, maize is a major staple for a majority of the people there. And uh, that's the region, a region that uh, is home to almost two thirds of the world's population. So you're looking at a large proportion of the global population having a, an exposure to aflatoxin levels that are beyond acceptable uh, limits. Now, people can become exposed in a variety of ways, uh, but uh, primarily dietary intake is the most common source of exposure. And uh, 
contamination starts in the field uh, during uh, the crop uh, growth phase after the fungi that produce aflatoxins invade the crop under favorable environmental conditions. And uh, once they settle in, uh, they produce aflatoxins. And after the crops are harvested and taken into the store, uh, aflatoxins accumulate under warm and humid conditions, especially if the crops have not been dried properly. And if contaminated food is processed, then aflatoxins enter the general food supply where they could end up in livestock feed, in pet food, or uh, in human food. And uh, on this slide, I will just very briefly talk about the strategies that are available for preventing uh, aflatoxin contamination of food or preventing uh, contaminated food from uh, getting into the supply system. And the approaches that are available are focused on either preventing the toxin from getting to the crop. Uh, those would include biocontrol, but others such as storage practices and breeding are also important. But there are also strategies for dealing with contamination after it's already occurred on the produce. And of course, at that point, we can only adopt a strategy that aims to prevent contamination from entering the food system. And under secondary prevention measures, uh, hand sorting, for example, uh, would be one of them. And detoxification approaches, as well as destruction. But at the tertiary level, we can also talk about regulation, which is like our final line of defense against aflatoxin contamination. And uh, obviously, considering the implication of aflatoxin contamination to health, to global trade, and to food safety, more than 100 countries have regulations that limit the maximum allowable amounts of aflatoxins uh, in foods and feeds. In the United States, uh, it's not allowed for any food to have more than 20 parts per billion of uh, aflatoxins. Uh, it's much lower for milk. So in this talk, I'll be focusing on biocontrol because it's, it has proven efficacy against aflatoxin uh, control. And comparing all of the aflatoxin prevention approaches that I've highlighted here, it is the cheapest and most effective in terms of scale of adoption. Uh, in terms of area of application, in terms of proven efficacy, and for uh, controlling aflatoxins in maize and groundnuts. The strategy utilizes an atoxygenic fungi to displace strains of aspergillae that uh, produce aflatoxins on crops. And through the use of this strategy, aflatoxin contamination in crops is reduced by uh, up to 96 percent. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. I apologize that the text is not in place, but it just shows how uh, the results of our field trials where we uh, applied treatments of biocontrol uh, with some of our biocontrols, and uh, we had about 90, 92 percent displacement of toxin producers with the atoxygenic strain. So on this slide, I just want to highlight a brief history of success, uh, showing that use of, of, of atoxygenics to control aflatoxins uh, is a very rare example of where biocontrol has actually worked in nature, especially on the scale we are talking about on a global scale. And uh, starting from the first uh, commercial fields treatments in 1996, the biocontrol technology has been successful uh, in, North Africa, in North America, in Africa, as well as in Europe. And currently, well over 1 million acres are treated every year uh, with biocontrol treatments with very excellent uh, reductions in aflatoxin contamination. Uh, currently, the emphasis uh, is to increase the genetics available for biocontrol by increasing the number of active ingredients in registered uh, products. Uh, current registered products uh, generally contain from one to four atoxygenic genotypes. The aflasive biocontrol products, for example, that are targeted at countries in Africa contain four genotypes each. 
and these products are already registered for use in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Ghana, in Senegal, and Burkina Faso. I'm sure Elisa will uh, speak more about this uh, shortly. But just to say that the biocontrol products are very effective everywhere they're used, and uh, this improves food security across the world and improves the safety of the environment as well because if you have toxin producers in the environment, people can inhale them and become sick as well. So I'll just end with a few recommendations for, uh, because I know there are some of us asking, what can I do? Uh, I'm hearing about this thing, what's the role uh, for me? Uh, one of the recommendations, of course, is that uh, help with aflatoxin biocontrol technology transfer is always welcome. I'm sure Elisa will also talk about this because after the product has been developed, it has to uh, then be taken to the areas of application and the technology has to be transferred. And the next one I will briefly talk about is GAPS. Of course, the GAPS continue to be a very important part of the strategy for controlling aflatoxins, especially because uh, the problem starts in the field. Another thing is it incentivization programs like what we have in Nigeria, where the Ag Results program is providing an incentivized payment to growers for adoption. It has been very helpful to adoption of this technology. And capacity building in SPS in general is a very necessary uh, component of the strategy for controlling aflatoxins. I have a, on the website, uh, on this slide, uh, the website to our lab, we have materials there, protocols, publications, and other things that people might find useful. So you're welcome to take a look uh, on the website. And uh, with that, I'll end the uh, presentation. Uh, over to you, Jolie. Thank you so much, Ken. This is Elisa, and I'll, I'll jump in now. So the next thing we just want to highlight about particularly uh, aflatoxin control and specifically the use of the biocontrol is the essential role of partnerships. This is not a, a singular effort. Uh, there's a lot of, of people and relationships involved that uh, truly exist to take the biocontrol from um, the, the work in the lab to the field to, to the fork to the consumer um, and, and to uh, ensure that uh, the level of aflatoxin in that product is, is a safe amount for human consumption. So I just wanted to highlight uh, where those key partnerships are in the uh, overall process of developing the biocontrol and, and as you, you heard a little bit about it, uh, on the left of the slide are the key steps uh, that are taken in the process of developing the biocontrol. And the Foreign Agricultural Service has particularly been involved in helping to build uh, relationships uh, in developing the biocontrol in Africa. So some of these examples come from that experience. So every, everything from developing baseline data for understanding what is the prevalence of aflatoxin to identifying those, those native atoxigenic strains that are utilized in the biocontrol uh, to field efficacy trials to prove the product is effective, to gaining that regulatory approval to ensure that the product can uh, be approved for market, and then you know, finally moving to the commercialization and the distribution and the dissemination of that product. There are key partners that are listed on the right-hand side that are intricately involved in that process. Everyone from academia and researchers such as ARS to our key uh, donor community and development partners to the essential government bodies and key actors at the national but also the regional and continental level uh, as well as international organizations and, and the critical components of the private sector. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, one particular example is that, for example, before conducting uh, field efficacy trials, it's very critical to ensure that the government is on board and very much aware of the biocontrol uh, process. Uh, for example, we've, we found, and particularly in Africa, that oftentimes there is a regulatory framework for pesticides, but not uh, often for, for biopesticides. So, in 2013, FAS partnered with an array of technical experts, including USAID, to develop a biopesticide guidance document to assist countries in developing a regulatory framework for biopesticides uh, and to ensure that that regulatory process could, could uh, take place. And to date, FAS has brought, uh, in partner with uh, the African Agricultural Technology Foundation and the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, has brought this really critical guidance documented tool to the governments of Malawi, Mozambique, and Zambia. So that's one critical role um, 
and process that is, is needed to ensure that that not just the science is there, but the whole regulatory process that you see to make sure that when you're, you're bringing that product to market, um, it, can, it can be utilized so that that, that kernel or, or, or you know, that groundnut is safe for human consumption. Just going to move to our next slide here. So in terms of relationships, our interagency collaboration has really been critical, particularly in Africa, both in bringing the biocontrol uh, to the continent, but also in aflatoxin control overall. We have had a very strong relationship, the Foreign Agricultural Service, with ARS, the Agricultural Research Service, for, for nearly a decade in, 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 on, in terms of aflatoxin awareness on the continent. Uh, in addition, it's not just an interagency um, Within, sorry, within USDA, but also within the U.S. government. USAID DC offices and missions have played an essential role in providing key resources and raising awareness and partnering with local partners to progress the work. Uh, in particular, um, the biocontrol uh, development in Africa has um, been led by the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, IITA. And as Ken mentioned, um, that biocontrol is named AFLASAFE. And because the biocontrol is using those local atoxinogenic strains, you're finding that the products are actually different products and they ad are adapted to the local environment. Uh, so for example, the product in Senegal is called Aflasafe SN01, and uh, the product in Ghana is called Aflasafe GH02. And just for a little bit more information, the uh, IITA uh, website for Aflasafe is available on the slide, and I highly recommend that you check it out to, to see what IITA is up to. They are developing the biocontrol in 17 countries, and six of which have full regulatory approval to sell the product. And you can uh, visit that website to understand how to purchase Aflasafe and also to receive full updates on all countries where IITA is active. This critical collaboration, which isn't just within USDA and the US government, but also involves critical development partners such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Meridian, uh, Meridian Institute, as well as many others that have helped to support funding, including the governments of Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, and others. All of this has led to an effort to not just um, promote biocontrol as a viable solution, but to promote aflatoxin awareness on the continent overall. This collaboration led to the development of the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa, which is a body within the African Union Commission. It was launched in October 2012 to support member states and regional economic communities to address multi-sectoral challenges caused by aflatoxin contamination. It is now firmly rooted within the AUC, within the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture, and it has a long-term mission to address aflatoxin as a, as a cross-cutting issue throughout the continent. Just for your awareness, the key countries where PACA focuses is the Gambia, Senegal, Nigeria, Malawi, Uganda, and Tanzania. I highly recommend visiting the website listed there uh, for information on, on how to connect with uh, country directors in each of those countries. Um, as I mentioned, I think this effort is not possible without key communication and collaboration. Uh, and in summary, I just want to mention that these examples do serve as models that have led to integrated efforts to truly address a very critical public health, trade, nutrition, and food safety issue. And it is through this sort of collaboration and willingness to partner that lives can be saved and sustainable impact can be achieved. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ken and Alisa. Uh, all right, we have some time, about uh, up to 30 minutes now, to continue with some questions. Um, we'll start with some questions that came in about aflatoxin, but you are welcome to continue to ask questions more generally about uh, holistic SPS efforts and about fall armyworms. All right, I'm going to position my mic here between myself and Elisa. Hopefully that will work. Um, all right, so uh, I have some questions for Ken and Elisa. Um, one that just came in that can be probably a quick answer. A bit earlier, John Lamb asked about how aflatoxins usually occur with other mycotoxins, some of which are also food safety or SPS hazards, uh, fumonisins and maize, for example. How effective are these biocontrols like aflasafe on any other worrisome mycotoxins? mycotoxins? And if not, uh, what to do about that? So, uh, Ken, I guess I, I can answer based on my, uh, would you like to, to discuss the biocontrol use? Oh, yes. Uh, there's not much to say except that there, uh, there are some biocontrol trials showing efficacy 
against these other mycotoxins, but in terms of scale of adoption and uh, efficacy in the field, uh, biocontrol against aflatoxins is by far the most successful. Uh, for the the other unique thing about the tech, the biocontrol technology for aflatoxins is we're actually using aspergillus flavor strains that don't produce toxins to competitively exclude toxin producers in crops. So it's a different model than, uh, for example, many of the other biocontrol approaches for the other uh, mycotoxins where you're looking like other organisms to uh, control those toxin producers through maybe biocidal effects or other pesticidal action. So those approaches are available, but in terms of scale and uh, use and efficacy, proven efficacy under field conditions in a wide range of situations, biocontrol with aflatoxins is by far the most successful. But there are also other approaches for managing those other mycotoxins, uh, such as uh, maybe things like wet milling or clay using clay absorbents or through enzymatic degradation, which are approaches that have been found to be useful in combination with, say, resistant varieties against fusarium. So those are all approaches that, especially used in combination, can be very effective in controlling those other mycotoxins as well. But as explained in this talk, uh, the focus and the major success story we've had so far is with aflatoxins. And these are by far the most widespread in terms of occurrence and uh, harm. Uh, aflatoxin B1 is the most, most toxic biological uh, poison available uh, in nature. So uh, it's very dangerous and uh, other aflatoxins like G1 and uh, B2 uh, are also very deadly and that's mostly why we focus so much on them. Uh, Eliza, you can uh, add a few things uh, also. Uh, I was just going to add, I don't, just uh, in terms of the partnerships we've, we've discussed, um, we have not been involved in developing uh, a similar biocontrol for any other mycotoxins besides aflatoxin. Um, all right. So uh, a question about, from Harley Stokes, that I think is interesting. Um, for adoption of biocontrol, do you see this being adopted by smallholder farmers, and is this a fin financially feasible option for them? And interestingly, uh, Lawrence Kaptaj did respond to that question saying, yes, in Nigeria, over 30,000 farmers use AfliSafe and commercialize AfliToxin-safe maize at premium prices besides saving for family consumption. Um, and uh, so uh, there's at least one example of when smallholders have been using AfliSafe, but do you have other examples or writ large of what do you think about smallholders of being able to afford to use this? And actually, I'm going to just bring up a, a side question. Uh, Valeria Sanchez uh, mentioned, uh, can you talk about perceived consumer demand for low aflatoxin products? Is the final consumer willing to pay for these aflasafe uh, ground nuts, for example? So how does that play into a smallholder farmer's decision uh, to adopt biocontrol? Elisa? Elisa, do you want to take that, or do you want me to uh, Ken, you like try to answer? I will say um, there are, you know, there are many examples, and to, to, to be frank, I, I really believe that the true partner to answer these questions is the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture that has so. really brought the biocontrol to think Africa in, like, a conference leading, room? Uh, the work on commercializing the product and making it available to smallholder farmers. Yeah. Uh, the Foreign Agricultural Services played a very critical role in helping to develop that product uh, and ensure its, its efficiency through the regulatory process uh, and the registration process. Um, and USAID has partnered uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and IITA on a, on a on a separate end to ensure that uh, that commercialization pr commercialization process is in place. Um, I will say IITA is, is um, providing some really nice examples via the chat room that demonstrate um, how and wh how the product is being made available to smallholder farmers. And um, I can't speak directly to, to premiums or incentives. 
um, primarily because that is a little bit outside of, of what we've been involved in. Um, uh, but I, I will say that there, there, is, there are many examples to, that point to how the product is, is being made available in a, a price efficient way and how it is, it has, the price for the product has decreased since uh, its initial development. All right. That's great. Thank you very much. Let's see. Um, a, a couple of questions came in about other elements that might affect um, maize crops besides just aflatoxin contamination. Um, and actually, I think one that's interesting and can pull in Chris is, are there explicit linkages between fall armyworm infestation and aflatoxin? That is, as fall armyworm damages the maize crop, the risk of aflatoxin might increase. Is, is that true or known to be true? Um, and so how might these two sectors coordinate? Chris, do you want to assist that? Yeah, so it's um, pretty well assumed to be true. I don't know what uh, scientific uh, justification, what data have been collected on that. But uh, pre-harvest, the main way for the uh, Aspergillus fungi to get into the corn is uh, it would have to get past the, uh, the sheath, the, uh, uh, you know, on, on the ears of the corn. And if fall armyworm, uh, which it tends to do, is it will, you know, start at the top of the ear through the silk and then eat its way down. That provides an opening within the protective cover on the, uh, on the corn cob. And, uh, and any you know fungal spores that are on the insect will be moved into uh, into the ear. So there's certainly good logical justification for that. But uh, as far as what data that I've seen, uh, I haven't looked into it that much in depth. But I know people who have, and we can get those numbers at at some point. Um, yes, I think that's that's very interesting. And and perhaps Ken, you can. Um, follow up on that question, but also um, address a, a side question that Frigis Sodeji uh, asked, which is we're aware that drought increases pre-harvest aflatoxin contamination. So how best can biocontrol integrate um, drought considerations, drought considerations, fall armyworm considerations? How does biocontrol integrate with other uh, uh, Regarding the question on the fall armyworms, I totally agree with Chris. I did a search very recently uh, on that subject and also was unable to find any uh, data directly linking fall armyworms to, uh, uh, to aflat increase in aflatoxin contamination. But as Chris said, it's very logical to assume a connection indirectly because of the, uh, in the access that fall armyworm damage would provide for aspergillus to invert the crop and subsequently produce toxins under favorable conditions. So uh, the data is still not there showing a direct connection. Uh, with regard to uh, stress management, that is also thought to be the case that uh, plants that are drought stressed will be more susceptible to aflatoxin uh, colonizer, uh, contamination. And generally, the aflatoxin is one component of plant health. And uh, in general, healthy plants will most likely do better and be safer, especially if other good agricultural other good agricultural practices are in place. And that's why in the recommendation slide, I highlighted the need for gaps that uh, we continue to emphasize those uh, as far as preventing aflatoxins and ensuring a healthy crop and safe food that uh, we can make available to people. So yes, not just drought tolerance, but other agricultural practices that uh, would enhance a healthy crop in general would also be helpful to minimizing aflatoxin contamination. Yeah, and uh, just to jump back to the fall armyworm connection really quickly is that the way that Aflasafe works is that uh, the non-toxin producing strains uh, outcompete the toxin producing strains. And that's super important uh, in a lot of this because if fall armyworm were to get into ears of corn uh, in fields that have been treated with Aflasafe, it would be the non-toxin producing strain that's getting into the corn. So therefore, there would be less aflatoxin produced uh, by any fall armyworm 
infestation as well. You know, there's a founder effect that when this corn goes into storage, that any aflatoxin that's produced post-harvest would be reduced as well because the fungi that are there are the non-toxin producing strains. So by applying early during the growing, you're knocking out the, even the potential for aflatoxin production. All Thank you, Chris. That's a very important uh, point. And, and cooked up. Yeah. And just to add, this is Lee, I wanted to say that, um, you know, a lot of with some of these SPS interventions um, and looking at, um, you know, is this something additional that we need to be doing? And I think, you know, a lot of this is based around um, even an application of AppleSafe is just in combination with best management practices. So as part of your um, quality assurance programs um, and et cetera, in terms of, of the way that uh, management practices both in production and post-harvest are applied, are going to mitigate a lot of these uh, potential SPS issues. Um, I also found that the conversation, that I think Ranajit, they mentioned about the application of, of premiums and, and the market demand for these things. Um, you know, it'd be good to look at what the data in terms of the awareness around, um, you know, consumer and local markets. Um, but also, um, you know, in terms of, you know, back to my presentation on, on the, for the export-oriented markets, um, to look at, um, you know, whether eventually, um, you know, crops proving essentially that they don't have these, um, you know, mycotoxins within them is, is essential in terms of export. Um, and so, um, you know, whether some premiums um, will play a, a role in, at least in the early stages, um, until um, in terms of adoption among smallholders and in certain value chains, key value chains, but eventually over time it will become the benchmark or the, or the norm. Um, and, and certainly in the application of both um, HACCP and, and even the FISMA regulations that are down the pike for, for export-oriented crops, this will be a, this will be a necessary um, thing. So, um, you know, investing in those control points like we mentioned earlier, whether it's at production or in the laboratory and testing um, for countries to be able to actually prove that these certain mycotoxins exist will be, will be critical. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's see. Um, we'll ask some, some sort of shorter questions that came in around uh, aflatoxin. Um, Ernest Tay asked, uh, about rapid detection for aflatoxin. Does rapid detection exist, and is it key in the fight oh, against Yes, aflatoxin? there are many kits for rapid detection. There are many uh, protein-based kits, which are uh, strip tests, where you can uh, immediately, uh, even in the field, be able to uh, quantify reasonably, at least detect, and to some extent quantify, at least within a reasonable range uh, of what the contamination levels are for crops. So yes, uh, those uh, tests are available. Uh, we don't develop them, but they are commercially available uh, in the market. And yes, they are very useful, especially where you may need to make a rapid decision uh, that may be tied to either SPS or a marketing situation. Uh, knowing if your the, the product you're buying is free from toxins can be a very key part of your decision-making tool. So that will, that will certainly be very useful. And uh, that's probably why they're very popular also, because of the speed of detection uh, that those afford. Uh, other than that, you can also use genomic approaches. There are also other uh, approaches you can use in the lab as well. Maybe those will take longer, but yes, there are kits available for rapid detection. And Ken, I can just add that Apocar recently uh, published a, a, just a, a general uh, report on those rapid methods available. Uh, that report is available on their website, and we'll make sure that we provide that, avail uh, that report to, to the audience as well. Uh, so um, the, the text is, is, is available to the audience. Thanks. Thank you. And um, a couple of questions have come in about push-pull technology. That's something I am not highly familiar with, and so I, I would, and maybe some others on the webinar are not either. So perhaps if, um, if one of our panelists could explain what is meant by push-pull technology, and then um, 
there was a question, have you tried using bio, or tried biocontrol using push-pull technology? Um, and also, let's see, um, and also push-pull technology for IPM, such as utilizing border grasses and intercropped grasses to protect the cereal crops from fall armyworm. So just to the extreme, uh, you can quickly explain what that is and how it's been used in these cases. Sure, so push-pull technology is uh, based on the principle if you attract a pest to something that you don't care about, such as uh, a pheromone trap where, where the pest is killed or Sometimes uh, people will use what's called a trap crop, which is uh, they plant it solely to attract the pest away from their higher value crop that they want to protect. Um, depending on the pest, you know, push-pull can, you know, be all sorts of different, uh, different combinations based on what the pest responds to. For fall armyworm in Africa, uh, the technology and the level of knowledge of what exactly is going to work in Africa isn't there yet. Um, you know, there's a lot of research going into that. Um, you know, there's resistant varieties. There's, uh, you know, are there varieties that could be used as a trap crop? Uh, how realistic is it to use pheromone traps rather than just monitor for the presence of the pest? But how realistic is it to roll out, like we did for bull weevil in the southwestern U.S., how uh, realistic is it to uh, put, you know, just traps everywhere and capture and kill so many of these pests that you reduce the populations? Um, you know, people are asking those questions and there's research going on. But we've only had two or three growing seasons in Africa where we've known that this pest was there. So there's work going on, but I don't, I don't think we have any clear conclusions yet because, uh, you know, the climate's so different in Africa, the natural predators are different in Africa. Um, you know, so it's one of those questions that remain to be answered. Very interesting. Um, anything further? No, I don't have anything to say. The other presenters on that? No? Um, we have, we have up to 10 minutes left for questions. I just wanted to highlight that we have put a few polls up on our screen. Uh, these are helpful for us shaping future presentations to, for you to share with us uh, what you learned today, what you thought was the most interesting, whether you can apply this to your work. Um, a little bit about how you plan to integrate what you've learned today. Um, and some of your opinions about whether this webinar was useful for you in providing uh, clear and actionable information. These things will help us uh, plan future webinars. Lee, were you about to no, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think, of, of course, you know, I, we're talking about integrated pest management, but I tend to think of, of push-pull in terms of market systems and trade. And, um, you know, and a lot of what we're doing with, with the USDA and with USAID is, is a regulatory um, capacity building within government. Um, so thinking about that policy and enabling environment. Um, although I'm also aware that many of you are, are kind of working on, on the incentive structure, and there's been a lot of discussion around that and the actual uptake, um, especially among smallholders. Ranajit asked a question about, you know, so how do we um, raise awareness among, you know, policymakers about these, this issue? And unfortunately, it's, it's always, you know, um, reactive more than it is proactive. And um, until we get large dev uh, dev devastating outcomes in terms of economic on a primary export crop, we don't kind of get the movement that we need um, among an investment that we need among governments um, and regional stakeholders. So I think, you know, we need to be thinking both at, you know, working with governments on both the regulatory side, um, but then also uh, continuing to build into our market systems and our value chain approaches the, the appropriate incentive structure. Um, you know, to, to deal with these issues. Um, and I think, you know, as I mentioned previously, that we'll also see these things very highly linked with quality and productivity um, in terms of best management practice. And so um, it'll, you know, be a win-win in terms of, um, you know, those objectives along with just ensuring that food is safe and nutritious. Great. Um, let's see. We're plowing through our question here. We have time for a few more. Um, I just think this is an interesting question probably for Ken, uh, and I selfishly would like to know the answer myself, from Matar Gay. Is, are there specific biological or other reasons for the relatively higher vulnerability of maize and groundnut to aflatoxin compared to other crops? We know that aflatoxin does affect many different crops, but um, 
what is it about maize and ground nuts that is making uh, that That's a very good question. And uh, I am not sure that I, <laughs> I know the answer in detail myself, but uh, some of the work we've done uh, in our lab shows that there are definitely some crop characteristics that uh, can influence the colonization by aflatoxin producing fungi. And one of them is definitely nutrients. And uh, we found uh, in some of the studies conducted in our lab that uh, nutrient rich substrates uh, in general also had richer amounts of. Uh, organisms growing there, including uh, my, uh, those organisms that produce aflatoxins. Uh, other than that, I'm not sure that I can speak competently on why uh, those two crops are such a major target. But I will look into that and uh, provide an answer. Maybe I can pass it on and we can make it available to the presenters, or to the participants, rather. Great, thank you so much, Ken. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. This came in a, a bit earlier uh, from Esther Nagumbi. How has technology been helpful in spreading information about available fall armyworm management and solutions? And this can apply to other food safety issues as well, but starting with fall armyworm. Yeah, so, um, I, and I noticed in the chat box earlier, somebody had mentioned uh, FAO's mobile app for uh, monitoring fall armyworm populations. And so when I mentioned the large data sets that are being, uh, that are being compiled, um, that's uh, probably the principal one that uh, uh, the people are using mostly. And uh, this is an app that uh, um, just is on smartphones, which you know, everybody in Africa has now. And, uh, and in the field, they're able to upload. And with the latest version of the app, it doesn't even need to be online when you're collecting data, just when you're trans, uh, transmitting it. And so uh, that's been hugely helpful in uh, finding out the extent of the problem. Uh, and as far as uh, you know, uh, dissemination of information. Uh, you know, I know in Zambia there's a WhatsApp group that a lot of people have formed around fall armyworm. Uh, not everybody participates in that, but it's been uh, uh, a good venue for discussion as well as, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, that, you know, everybody can do, you know, on their phones now. And, uh, you know, Twitter blasts. And, uh, and even SMS blasts in some cases where uh, they can get authoritative information out to a lot of people very quickly. And, you know, and like I said, you know, everybody in Africa has a cell phone now. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it amazed me the first time I went that they seem to be, you know, ahead of the U.S. in, uh, in mobile applications. And, you know, U.S. has caught up a bit lately, but... Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't really see how we could have had as effective a fall armyworm response as we've had without mobile technologies. Right. Very interesting point. Thank you. All right. Well, we are coming up on the end of our webinar. I've been really excited to see all of the comments and experiences and resources that have been shared in the chat box. So thank you very much to you, our participants. Uh, for being so active and engaging and, and sharing what you know. That's, I think that really adds um, an extra layer uh, for, for the other participants on the webinar. And also for the speakers, we will surely be um, reading back through all of your comments and, and seeing what we can glean and um, sharing additional resources through AgriLinks. So please do keep your eye open for an email with the recording of this webinar. Uh, with the transcript and with some additional suggested resources. And we do have a lot on AgriLinks uh, that April has been sharing in the chat box, a featured collection, and of course we want you to visit the um, Food Safety Network's hub on AgriLinks as well. So I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters and to the supportive AgriLinks team who makes these webinars happen. And we will see you at future